What I'm about to tell you is going to give you the chills through and through. You are not going to believe the verifications of everything that has been said regarding um, my video on the King's Royal Cipher being the mark of the beast. A beast is a king, according to the prophet Daniel. The king's mark is, is extremely important. And I had the dream of the royal cipher being the mark of the beast, which is the mark of the king. I saw the crown. I saw the 666 intertwined in the crown. And it was only until this year... Uh, when King Charles III's royal cipher was actually created, that I knew what the dream meant. And it is connected to him making his carbon footprint net zero. Cipher means zero. Carbon means 666. It all came together. But there is something incredible that just happened that is going to blow your mind. I mean, this has got to go viral because this is showing you the final details of a verification, not only of my Royal Cipher revelation, but also in 1998 when Tim Cohen wrote the book The Antichrist in a Cup of Tea, talking about Charles and him sitting on the throne that had the Dragon of Wales on it, and he showed the winged statue, Savior of the World. Uh, he showed the heraldry, which the heraldry has the lion and the unicorn, and he went into detail about the elements on that heraldry. My thing was completely different. It's the king's mark, which is his royal cipher. Well, the king just put his mark on something, and you are not going to believe what it is. This is going to raise the hair on your head. You are going to be shocked. We're going to talk about this, and we're going to talk about the subtle meanings within these elements. But God is giving a huge verification of every one of these details. This is going to blow your mind. It's going to just blow your mind. The Pope gifts two fragments from the cross Jesus Christ was crucified on to King Charles so they can lead the new monarch's coronation procession. Two fragments from Jesus' cross. This was just updated April 19th, 2023 by Chris Matthews of Daily Mail. And it says two shards from the cross were given by Pope Francis to Mark King's coronation. The small fragments of wood have been incorporated into the Cross of Wales. The King's coronation procession will be led by a cross that includes religious relics gifted to the monarch by the Pope. Two shards of the true cross, which is said to have been used in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, were given to Charles by Pope Francis to mark his enthronement. And, uh, of course, I've talked all about him sitting on the throne of David, what they think is the throne of David for King Charles III's coronation. The small fragments have been incorporated into the Cross of Wales, which will be seen by millions as it is carried into Westminster Abbey on May 6th. Both pieces are shaped as crosses, one being one centimeter in size and the other five millimeters and are set into the larger silver crucifix behind a rose crystal gemstone so they can only be viewed up close. The Cross of Wales, and remember uh, the dragon is on the flag of Wales and that was at... Uh, Prince Charles then investiture sitting on that throne chair with the dragon, which is what Tim Cohen had showed in his book um, about Charles possibly being the AC, otherwise known as Antichrist. Okay, so that happened back in 1998 when he wrote that book, and there's been developments, and one of the developments was the dream that I had 
and this, the cross of Wales, which is a gift from the king to the church in Wales to celebrate its cemetery, will be blessed by the Archbishop of Wales, Andrew John, in a service at Holy Trinity Church, Landudno, North Wales, today before it heads to London. They show pictures of King Charles, who hammered the hallmark, which is his mark, onto the silver used in the cross, alongside the pomp and pageantry. The coronation on May 6th is a religious ceremony. Now, I'm going to show you the pictures. So here is Charles hallmarking. He's stamping the king's mark on the silver cross of Wales at the Goldsmiths Center in London last year. The small fragments have been incorporated into the Cross of Wales. Both pieces are shaped as crosses, one being one centimeter in size and the other five millimeters, and are set into the larger silver cross behind a rose crystal gemstone so they can only be viewed up close, and in, it shows these pictures. Upon its return, the cross will be shared between the Anglican and Catholic churches in Wales. Crafted from recycled silver bullion, provided by Royal Mint in Lantrasant, South Wales, it also includes a shaft of Welsh windfall timber and Welsh state. Words from the last sermon of St. David are inscribed on the back of the cross in Welsh, which read, and it's in Welsh, of course, it's translated as be joyful, keep the faith, do the little things. Now those were the hallmarks, the mark of the king that was stamped into the back of the silver cross in this picture. In other words, they contain the king's mark.
The silver elements bear a full hallmark, including the royal mark, a leopard's head, which was applied by the king himself in November last year when visiting the Goldsmith Center in London. He stamped it with the king's royal mark of a leopard head. Archbishop Andrew said, We are honored that His Majesty has chosen to mark our centenary with a cross that is both beautiful and symbolic. Its design speaks to our Christian faith, our heritage, our resources, and our commitment to sustainability. We are delighted, too, that its first use will be to guide their majesties into Westminster Abbey at the coronation service. The Roman Catholic Archbishop of Cardiff and Bishop of Menevia, Mark O'Toole, said, With a sense of deep joy, we embrace this cross, kindly given by King Charles and containing a relic of the true cross, generously gifted by the Holy See. It is not only a sign of the deep Christian roots of our nation, but will, I am sure, encourage us all to model our lives on the love given by our Savior Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic Archbishop of Cardiff and Bishop of Menevia, Mark O'Toole, said, We look forward to honoring it, not only in the various celebrations that are planned, but also in the dignified setting in which it will find a permanent home. Designer and maker Michael Lloyd said, The commission has allowed me to delve into the previous 1,000 years of faith and history. Now, with more than 267,000 hammer blows, the cross has emerged from the inanimate sheets of silver, and I am delighted it will be used as part of the coronation service on the 6th of May. Dr. Francis Parton, Deputy Curator of the Goldsmiths Company, who managed the commission, said, Using the ancient craft of chasing silver, Michael Lloyd has created a beautiful object which combines a powerful message with a practical purpose. We are thrilled that the cross will both feature in the coronation and see regular use within the church in Wales. The public service held in Lantresant began at 9 a.m., the start of the church's governing body meeting. The true cross, what is it? A Christian relic is reputedly the wood of the cross on which Jesus Christ was crucified. Legend says the true cross was found by St. Helena, mother of Constantine the Great, during her pilgrimage to the Holy Land in about 326 A.D. The earliest historical reference to the homage of the true cross occurs in the mid-fourth century. By the eighth century, the accounts were enriched by legendary details describing the history of the wood of the cross before it was used for the crucifixion. Adoration of the true cross gave rise to the sale of its fragments, which were sought as relics. French theologian John Calvin said that all the existing fragments if put together would fill a large ship, an objection regarded as invalid by some Roman Catholic theologians who claimed that the blood of Christ gave to the true cross a kind of material indestructibility so that it could be divided indefinitely without being diminished. Such beliefs resulted in the multiplication of relics of the true cross wherever Christianity expanded in the medieval world, and fragments were deposited in most of the great cities and in a great many abbeys. Shrines designed to hold the fragments also multiplied, and some precious object of this kind survive. The desire to win back or obtain possession of the true cross was claimed as justification for military expeditions, such as that of the Byzantine Emperor Herculaeus against the Persians in 622-28, to and the capture of Constantinople by the Crusaders in 1204. The feast of the finding of the cross was celebrated in the Roman Roman Catholic Church on May 3rd until it was omitted from the church calendar in 1960 by Pope John 
I guess 23 is his number. Another article on this, published by Janine Henney, published on April 19th, 2023, King Charles's coronation cross includes wood from Jesus' true cross, a gift from Pope Francis. The cross of Wales, which will lead the coronation procession at Westminster Abbey on May 6th, incorporates a relic of the cross on which Jesus was crucified. King Charles's coronation cross includes a holy gift from Pope Francis, believed to be connected to Jesus Christ. On Wednesday, the cross that will lead the coronation procession at London's Westminster Abbey on May 6th was blessed in Wales. The cross of Wales, as it's called, features two splinters reportedly taken from the cross Jesus was crucified on 2,000 years ago, and these represent the thorns and thistles of the Garden of Eden because of the curse of mankind, and Jesus bore our sins on the cross, so the cross and these splinters represent sin and Jesus bearing our sin on the cross. Could that make him the man of sin? because this is going forward to his coronation. Wow. The Times reports that the pieces of wood measuring about 0.2 and 0.4 inches were a personal coronation gift from the Pope to the king, adding that the Vatican believes the wood is from the true cross. The splinters have been arranged in the shape of a cross in the center of the cross of Wales behind a rose crystal gemstone at its center, like the other article stated. It's hugely significant. It's a remarkable thing that the king has been able to find favor with the Vatican, and as a result of that good relationship, Pope Francis has agreed to gift these small fragments of the Holy Cross. The Archbishop of Wales the most reverend Andrew John told the Times. The embellishment was recently added to the Cross of Wales just in time for the coronation. Charles 74th commissioned Goldsmiths Company in London to make the Cross of Wales in 2020 to celebrate the centenary of the church in Wales. The commemorative cross is made of recycled silver bullion with Welsh windfall timber and slate. Charles did the honors of applying the king's mark leopard's head to the cross during a visit to goldsmiths in november 2022 which the company says is a first for a monarch lines from the last sermon in saint david the patron saint of wales are etched on the back of the cross be joyful keep the faith do the little things the etching says in welsh according to the church in wales the archbishop of wales blessed the cross of wales at the holy trinity church in Landudno, the church said in a morning service that was open to the public on Wednesday after the cross leads the procession, which Prince George will be part of. At the coronation on May 6th, it will be shared between the Anglican and Catholic churches in Wales. Charles became King Charles the moment his mother died, but the coronation is to do with the job and being the monarch in the eyes of all the people, royal historian Robert Lacey previously told people. Well, it's actually in doing him with power and authority under the uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's how the coronation ceremony is supposed to go. So, following nearly a thousand years of tradition, the service will be conducted by the Archbishop of Canterbury. The coronation will reflect the monarch's role today and looks forward to the future while being rooted in long-standing traditions and pageantry, Buckingham Palace previously said. Let's just say that these so-called splinters or thorns from the cross, the thorn is most commonly interpreted in relation to persecutions or hardships Paul faced. Other interpretations include one pre-Vatican II Roman Catholic writer thought that it denotes suggestions of impiety, Paul's agony over Jewish rejection of the gospel. The spiritual meaning of the cross in Christian terms, is a salvation through Messiah's sacrifice, redemption, atonement, suffering, faith. The cross also signifies acceptance of death or suffering and sacrifice. 
but mostly the power of the cross of Messiah, Christ, reconciles humanity with our Heavenly Father. In Jesus, Yeshua, we find forgiveness of sin. So he bore our sin on the cross. So those fragments represent the sin that Jesus bore on our cross. And they precede this king in the coronation ceremony. They represent the sin of humanity. This could very well be a symbolic meaning of the man of sin. And what did we see in Genesis 3? Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. That's what the cross, the crown of thorns, represents. The thorn and thistles of the curse. Cursed is the ground. So, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, and for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So, once again... I'm saying that these two fragments of the cross represent Jesus bearing humanity's sin on the cross. And that's preceding this king at his coronation. The cross was a sign of the curse of the sin of the world. So the king stamped his hallmark, his mark, the king's mark, onto this cross. And the Mark was the head of a leopard. Now remember in another video, I was telling you Charles's full name was Charles Philip Arthur George. And I told you the meaning of the name Arthur. And it's believed to be derived from the word artos, meaning bear. See? As experts differ on its precision origin, the name can also mean Thor the Eagle and Strongman. Arthur, bear, became a popular choice during the Middle Ages as families named their boys after King Arthur of 6th century England. Arthur is a traditionally masculine name with many different language roots and meanings. Its Scots Celtic root is Artos, meaning bear, and Arthur is said to mean strong as a bear. In Welsh, the name specifically means bear hero. This is my bear hero right here. <laughs> Arthur also draws from the Roman clan named Artorius which means noble or courageous, and the Irish word art, which means stone. Variations include art, armel, artist, arty, arturo, and even auberon, which also means bear-like. The most famous Arthur was, of course, King Arthur, a legendary 6th century king of England who pulled a sword from a stone, helmed the round table of knights, Lancelot, wed Guinevere and embarked on a quest for the Holy Grail. The name Arthur appears in Shakespeare as well as in King John's Arthur as the name of Duke of Bretagne. So not only did King Charles make his hallmark the king's mark on the cross that represents the leopard head, but one of his names means bear. And we know already that in his heraldry, and for centuries the kings of England, their heraldry have had the lion, which Tim Cohen showed in his book. Obviously, it's the royal heraldry. Now, remember that the article stated that Charles did the honors of applying the king's mark, in parenthesis, leopard's head, to the cross during the visit to the goldsmiths in November of 2022. 
So now we can complete Revelation 13.2 in this verification. The beast, and remember, a beast I told you was a king, as according to the prophet Daniel, the beast, the king, I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the king, the beast, his power and his throne and great authority. The dragon of Wales, that throne chair that Charles was sitting in during his investiture as the Prince of Wales. And that was what Tim Cohen had showed in his book about the um, Antichrist in a cup of tea. So now this is a verification of everything. This Revelation 13.2, the king I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that as a lion, and the dragon gave the beast his power and the throne and great authority. He has all four like nobody ever on the earth. You should have the chills like never before. So then we go to Daniel 7 and we see Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast. So these are like two kings. A second is like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said... Thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So here we have the symbolism of the leopard, the lion, and the bear in the past. This is interesting because this was a bear that had the three ribs in the mouth of it. Now remember, we just had the Shah of Iran, which is ancient Persia, making a prayer of peace, freedom, and security, and putting that prayer in the Western Wall with the Israeli rabbis. And the winged lion was the symbol of ancient Persia. It was also taken and used in Babylon. So among modern interpreters, there is a consensus that the three ribs represent three nations subjugated by the Persians. They also represent three kingdoms that pose the greatest threat to their power, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt, or some think Media, Lydia, and Babylon. The command to devour much flesh emphasizes Persia's superior military might over the peoples from Asia Minor and Egypt to India. But think about this. Charles is representing the bear in his name, Arthur bear hero. And think about that there were three countries subjugated under England. Scotland, Ireland, Wales. And he rules from London, England. Three. That's like three ribs in his mouth. Why ribs? If you think about ribs, they're all attached to each other. Each one is a separate bone, and they're in the same rib cage, which protects your respiratory and your breathing. You might also want to know that the winged lion was in Persian mythology, and 
it was called Lamassu or Shedu in Mesopotamian mythology, depicted as a winged lion. It was often depicted with a bull's body instead of a lion's body. The griffin in classic mythology was depicted as a lion eagle creature. And of course, it is the griffin, which is a dragon, and it's got other elements of some of these creatures on the flag of Wales, which is what Tim showed in his book. The winged lion was with a ram's head decorated in the palace of Darius I in Susa. Susa was the capital of the ancient Persian Empire, and that was its symbol. And the winged lion was in Babylon on the Ishtar Gate. So now, in that symbology, we have King Charles III coming together with the winged lion, which is the monarchy of the Shah of Iran, who wants to restore the parliamentary monarchy of Persia, of Iran, right now, as we're speaking. That's what he wants. And to bring Israel peace, freedom, and security. And you've got King Charles III about to be coronated, representing his mark of the leopard head and the bear in his name and the lion of England. Now you've got to hear this. This is about the Goldsmith Company SA office put down its roots at Goldsmiths Hall more than 700 years ago. And this is where King Charles went to put the King's Mark, the leopard's head, on the cross. And it says, the first of its kind, it has grown from testing a relatively small number of articles in the 14th century to handling more than 3 million articles in 2014. The changing face of the industry means that technological developments in assaying, marking, and laboratory testing are both necessary and inevitable. Whilst the office is steeped in tradition with staff who, between the number of hundreds of years of knowledge and expertise, the changing face of the industry means that technological developments in assaying, marking, and laboratory testing are both necessary and inevitable. Whilst the office is steeped in tradition with staff who between them number hundreds of years of knowledge and expertise. It is also an organization which is continually moving with the times to meet both the demands of modern day production and needs of the customer. This is about the Leopard's Head by Jane Need. And it says the Leopard's Head was first used in 1300 as the King's Mark of Authenticity. It was introduced. It's in Revelation 13, exactly where I told you I saw Israel putting a king upon the throne of David. The leopard is represented. The leopard's head was first used in 1300 as the king's mark of authenticity. It was introduced by Edward I. He's the one who stole the coronation stone of Scone from the Scottish kings when he invaded Scotland and he captured the coronation stone of the Scottish kings and took it to England and coronated all their kings and queens upon the stone and it will be under Charles's throne chair of Edward I at his coronation ceremony on May 6th. But the lion's mark of authenticity was introduced by Edward I to protect and preserve the standards of gold and silver wares and the mark itself was taken from the three lions passant on the royal arms, a Leo part being a lion full face. The image of the Leo part was first altered in 1478 when a crown was added in order to differentiate between articles marked before and after this date. On this time, the Goldsmiths Company appointed its first common assayer, Christopher Elliot, and gold and silversmiths were required to bring their wares to Goldsmiths Hall to receive the mark of the hall. It is from this date that the word hallmarking enters the English language. With its connections 
and connotations of quality and excellence. The mark remained a crowned lion with variations in its face, which was usually shaggy, and in the crown as new engravers were employed. However, in 1822 the crown was dropped, and the lion begins its transformation into a leopard. Over the years, they have changed the face of the leopard in the king's mark. Whilst the leopard's head mark has evolved over time, the most pronounced changes has been in clarity and detail. It is a development one might expect given that the early punches would have been made entirely by hand. In fact, advances in the technology used to create punches will be instrumental in taking the leopard's head into the 21st century with crisper, cleaner marks and the introduction of the first real three-dimensional laser mark. Could the laser mark be incorporated as the King's Royal Cipher incorporating the leopard's head with his name containing the bear and the lion? Wow! All punches and support tools used by the SA office are made in-house by the Engineering Service Department, a necessity these days due to a reduction in the number of UK workers possessing the required skills. The department is a hidden gem run by Pat Greary and his team of talented engineers, Simon Jones, James Richardson, and Daniel Love, and it is also responsible for the maintenance of all machinery enduring the smooth running of the hallmarking production process. Hallmarking is putting the king's mark on things. Punch making is a highly skilled craft which is carried out using a combination of machining of a blank engraving with a pantograph or laser and finishing by hand. It begins by manufacturing a steel blank into which four hallmark panels are cut. Before the panels can be engraved, the materials surrounding them must be removed. The introduction of a CNC milling machine in 2014 speeded up a time-consuming process, and now, once the outline of the panels is programmed into the computer, the machine quickly cuts away the surrounding material. Pat and his team are constantly testing the technology to find more efficient ways of carrying out tasks, including creating steel supports that will allow the machine to cut four punches at a time. The next stage in the process is to engrave each individual hallmark, the King's Mark panel. Traditionally, a pantograph was issued. The pantograph has two arms. One is guided by the engineer, the stylist, and follows the master pattern. The other recreates the movements with a cutting tool, the spindle, producing a scaled-down replica of the master at a ratio ranging from 1.51 to 10.1. By lifting up and over sections, the Z-axis engraving in a third direction can be carried out to create 3D relief and a highly detailed mark. In 2011, lasers were introduced for engraving. The line beam width makes them ideal for engraving smaller marks, as a light beam is finer than the radius of a cutting tool, which also wears down over time. The laser is also less labor intensive as several punches up to 24 can be loaded into the laser to be made automatically without the need for an operator. Pantograph engraver is still used to produce punches for large marks as it is more efficient for the removal of large quantities of material. When the engineers moved to laser punch manufacturing, all of the masters for the marks were scanned as 3D images. These images were then converted into artwork that could be read by the new laser machine. Now remember that this king is going to put an image in the newly built temple. And this is a 3D image here. These images were then converted into artwork. Okay, the lasers 
rasters across the surface of the punch blank like a TV image. A smooth 3D topography is built up as the beam cuts in thousands of ultra-thin layers. Once the panels are engraved, the punch is finished by hand, hardening, cleaned, and polished, and then checked under a microscope. If a punch is not perfectly made, the hallmark will never be perfect. The combination of using the latest technology along with traditional skills to make punches is an incredible achievement. Pat and his team are dedicated to improving every stage of the manufacturing process, assuring quality of tools and punches, and thus the ultimate quality of the mark. But why stop with punch manufacturing? The experience gained during the punch project gave Pat and Will Evans, the systems development manager, an insight into how the new technology could make a significant difference to the quality of hallmarks applied using a laser. So the king's mark can be used and be implemented by using a laser. Laser hall marking was introduced in the late 1990s. It now accounts for around 50% of all items hallmarked. The main reason for its success is that laser marking is an etching process which does not involve mechanical movement of the metal. The propensity or damage is eliminated, making it ideal for fragile, hollow, stone set, and mixed metal pieces. The timing of its introduction could also not have been better. Around 90% of all items submitted to the assay office are now important, reflecting the growth in recent years in companies manufacturing or sourcing jewelry in the Far East and Thailand. Historically, unfinished items were sent in by skilled silversmiths for hand marking, and an integral part of the making process was the manual setting back and polishing of the marked item. The trained silversmiths who would have carried out these finishing operations have been replaced by importers and middlemen with no silversmithing skills. The articles arrive in a finished condition and the non-destructive nature of the laser marking is thus perfect for them. The leopard's head was first used in 1300 as the king's mark. And we see it there in Revelation 13. The beast is a king, and the leopard was associated with him. The leopard's head, the mark of the king. An increasingly popular benefit of laser marking is the ability for customers to apply customized logos and personalization to the option to mark at any size rather than being restricted to the size of their punch. So this could be used by the king to put his mark on the people. The oldest laser machines used in hallmarking production are really only suitable for large display marks. The beam is powerful and has a high tolerance on curves, but it is too wide for small marks. The increasing requirement to mark imported jewelry where marks needed to be smaller led to the purchase of machines with finer beam qualities. However, both generations of machines were only capable of producing marks in two dimensions by extending the two-dimension mark into a third dimension to create a 2D plus mark or deep laser mark as it is termed, a three-dimensional effect can be created. This inability to create a full three-dimensional mark has led many customers to consider a laser mark as inferior to a struck mark. Fortunately, with their knowledge of the potential offered by new laser technology, Pat and Will saw an opportunity to bring laser marks up to the same standard. Will and Pat worked with Essays, the company which had supplied the engineering department's laser to purchase four new machines that are specifically designed for jewelry and small items. The machines, which are significantly smaller overall, have a much finer beam and can create a more detailed image, thereby improving the quality of smaller marks and ensuring it is no longer the customer's second choice. Laser beams engraved by plotting straight lines from fixed points or nodes. The fine beam on the new lasers means that nodes can be plotted close together, which creates finer detail and the impression of a smoother curve.
More importantly, the artwork derived from a 3D scan produces node-to-node -node contour patterns that enable the lasers to engrave in relief without compromising on detail. It is this capability which has led to the creation of a genuine three-dimensional laser mark with the quality and clarity of a struck mark, regardless of its size. It is an enormous project the artwork library created by Pat and his team has first of all to be inverted so that the lasers cut the design into the metal to create the mark rather than out of it to create the punch. Once the scans have been successfully inverted, three-dimensional artwork files have to be created and imported to create a virtual punch with four to five panels just like the steel punches made by Pat and his team. As it is such a lengthy process, it will be offered to customers as a special added value service and the Deputy Warden, Robert Organ, expects it initially to appeal to a smaller number of contemporary designers. However, Robert envisages that the service will increase in popularity as the demand for laser marking continues to grow. Whilst there will always be a requirement for the unique skill craft of hand marking, it is his contention that contemporary and cutting-edge designers will favor the advantages that modern laser technologies has to offer. These exciting developments look set to have a lasting effect on the entire hallmarking process from the common artwork that is used in the creation of punches and laser marks to the wholesale improvement in the quality of every mark, whether struck or lasered, and the inception of a genuine three-dimensional laser mark. The new technology will surely blur the lines between the two techniques giving customers a greater choice and better overall quality. There is no doubt that Will Pat and his team will continue to search for new ways to improve the manufacturing and production process, bringing the leopard's head into the 21st century and ensuring that it endures for another 700 years. The king's mark, the leopard's head, mentioned in Revelation 13. Now you have verification. Now you should have the chills because this is God showing you beforehand before it comes to pass. And we are eyewitnesses to the prophetic events transpiring before our eyes, people. And he has the mouth of a lion because the lion is on the flag of England. So when he speaks out of his mouth, he speaks to the what I think are three ribs, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. He speaks to them as their king. And the lion, the words come out of the mouth of the lion to these nations. And I just, I want to read Revelation 13, 2 again to finish this out. The beast, which is a king, the king I saw resembled a leopard, but he had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion, the dragon gave the beast, the king, his power and his throne and great authority. And when does the king receive the power and authority? It's at the coronation ceremony when he's given the crown upon his head and the royal scepters in his hands. And this cross of Jesus Christ will be there with the thorns that represent the cross that Jesus bore the sin of humanity on the cross and this king is claiming to have a genealogical line of King David and I believe the Jews are going to accept him and anoint him as their king and you've got the king former king of Persia's descendant that wants to gain control as another king there's four kings so we also have Muhammad bin Salman, and we have the King of Jordan. It's all coming together, and this is a verification of everything that Tim Cohen said, and it's now coming to pass. That's what I'm trying to say. His book came out in 1998, but it's been a long haul of is it going to really develop like that or not? Well, when I had my dream about the royal cipher, I was unprepared for cipher to mean 
zero. As I said, Charles got his carbon footprint, supposedly. He wants to get it down to zero in England through his green agenda. So if they are using lasers for hallmarking, as it's called, or putting the king's mark on things, and lasers are already being used to remove tattoos from skin, lasers are used for resurfacing the skin, is it possible then that the laser itself will be used through this system to hallmark the people with the king's royal mark, the leopard's face, and his royal cipher, which has his name, his number, and his title, and his crown on it, which gives you authentication that you are a subject of the king and that you can buy and sell if you have the king's royal mark. Wow! Oh, man, this is incredible. This is a development from everything shown in the past. If you are not absolutely blown away, this should show you we are so incredibly close to the Lord appearing 